project that I've been working on with some other folks in the OpenStack community for the last uh, about five months. Uh, I can tell you a little about myself. I've been at Yahoo for about six years now. Uh, so we're located in the California, Sunnyvale, Bay Area, Yahoo. Uh, from New York, uh, so all U.S. Yay. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I've so been involved with uh, OpenStack for about the last uh, two and a half years. Did some other stuff internally. And uh, I've been pretty active in trying, and a lot on the discussion list. You probably know my name from for various good or bad reasons. Uh, so yeah, so welcome. thanks for all coming. Just going to give a little overview of sort of what Taskful is and how it, how it connects into OpenStack or at least part of the vision I have for it in OpenStack or, and, and sort of how other people can help it and where it currently, like what kind of problems it solves and all those kind of good things. Uh, so sort of, sort of the reason that I sort of built Taskflow or, uh, after doing a lot of work with various projects in OpenStack is there's this constant kind of issue around re-implementation of this problem called what I call state management achitis, which is not a real word, but that's one I made up. Uh, it's sort of about how workflows in the various components uh, are, all, are all sort of ad hoc it, it, and hard to alter and hold, hard to understand in, in a general manner. And there's not, they're, they're very distributed, they're very uh, coded as needed in, in, in a way. So there's certain problems that happen when you, when you go down that path and certain projects have seen that more than others. Or when you have, when you have the speed of uh, just creating workflows ad hoc, you, you sort of lose out on sort of advanced operations that you could do that are sort of necessary for uh, a system like OpenStack and certain the subsystems that compose OpenStack like Nova, uh, Cinder, Glance. Uh, some of the sort of the obvious stuff is that these kind of distributed systems, just making them work in a reliable manner, is not an easy thing. Yahoo has a lot of experience doing it, and it, it's not an easy problem that, that that in general at all. Like there's reasons why Zookeeper and a lot of other pro pro processes and programs exist to help out in this process. Uh, Hadoop was one thing that we built that also has similar issues. So. There's certain things that I've tried to take from those various projects and try to help out with this task force project. Uh, some of the things, some of one of the examples from the Cinder uh, project that I helped out with during Havana was the kind of this RPC boundary that you see in, in a lot of the projects. It's sort of a scalability boundary uh, where you can actually scale out horizontally by having more RPC receivers. Uh, but that also creates problems with just state consistency. When you have a boundary that you have to jump across via an RPC message that goes into a queue, you have to figure out what that means when it, when it takes a long time to get there, or what kind of states or what kind of resources are, are, in, a, a, are in different uh, different states of existence at that point. So this is sort of one of the issues that we've been working through with the Cinder folks about how to do a state machine that we can talk about a little bit later, too. Uh, if, if you look at the code, you'll see there's quite a bit of, if just by analyzing the code, you'll find that there's race conditions that may, may just be systems or symptoms of other problems, but they exist. So there's, there's certain optimizations that we can work around with a library like Taskflow, which I'll go into a little bit more about, and how we can sort of improve the, the process that exists to make it work in a more reliable manner. So some of the other issues, of course, when I mentioned manager, the driver API boundary, this is, a, bit, a bigger problem for projects like Nova and Cinder, which actually have the drivers, <coughs> volume drivers, or, high, or virtualization drivers. And there's, a, there's an API between them, but there's not a, a, a good defined state machine that happens inside the driver layer. So there's been, I think, I'm not sure how many bugs, but there has been bugs about uh, certain processes inside of Cinder, the drivers, sort of doing things that maybe the manager layer does not want them to do like manipulating database records that they shouldn't be having access to or, or going into undefined states that make it hard for the manager layer to recover from. So something like that is a good example of that boundary. Uh, state recovery, of course, is, is, a t is an interesting question when you have, the, you need to do upgrades of the various pieces of the software. So without that kind of recovery built in, you sort of have a problem when you need to just terminate the process to do an upgrade. So say you want to have a, a cinder volume process, you want to stop it to do a software upgrade. Uh, when you're stopping and you can't really predict what it's doing at that current moment by having something like Taskflow existing, it's hard to do a stop on that process directly without having to go do some manual cleanup later. So at Yahoo, we've seen this with Nova Compute. If you try to stop it during an upgrade, 
there are some periodic tasks that will run later when you start it back up to try to recover from where it left off. Uh, that's sort of de delayed recovery. So that's not always the best way to go about it either. Uh, so I'll propose sort of what we've done in Taskflow to help in increase that reliability. So an obvious question, why does this matter? Uh, there's various reasons. I mean, one, the upgrade path is sort of one of those reasons for me personally because every six months there's a new release that you have to move to or you get stuck in these hard upgrade cycles that take a lot of human resources to just manage and coordinate. Uh, various companies have, are going through that like every six months, so we are as well. Uh, you want to have this kind of API reliability, so that's sort of always having API uptime. If you, can, if you have to shut down your processes and you have to do manual work to recover them when you upgrade, that means some part of your system is going to be down at that time. Uh, so minimizing the manual work needed to actually upgrade and recover from the upgrade is, is a big part of keeping your system reliable. Of course, as well, any kind of state corruption that happens, you have to, will cost people money, right? If those manual processes to do the recovery of that also cost you money and people and time. So those are all things that if you, if you design with a little foresight, you can, you can try to avoid most of those. Of course, there's always situations where you have to get people involved, and that's, that's why we're here. But, uh, so one of the under, well, other part of the, the problem that I've been trying to help out with is making sure that you can understand the workflows and the various state transitions that happen inside of the various projects. So that includes things like how does the virtual, how is Nova boot a VM, and how can you alter that, that boot to do different things? Say you want to do something special in your cloud, like call out to another database, or or call out to another web service without, without sort of having a well-defined workflow. It's hard to know exactly what to do and when to do it and what the side effects will be. So certain things like that become, at least have been necessary at Yahoo for doing various uh, legacy integrations. So we've had to, you have to have those, that human resource knowledge to actually go into the code and actually understand it at a level deep enough that you can actually make those alterations. That's not something that all these different projects can, or all these different companies that use OpenStack can actually afford to have that kind of internal knowledge that requires people to actually go deep into the code to figure out how to add different things on. Uh, yeah, as we discussed before, just doing upgrades has been problematic for Yahoo. I know other, like certain other companies or people have, have different strategies around upgrades. Some of them just involve actually like rebuilding a new cloud. So we've been trying not to do that at Yahoo just because that seems like a waste of resources and it, it is but it's, it's riskier, so it would be nice to have this kind of state consistency and helper library to actually make that upgrade process more streamlined, require less manual work. Uh, so if we can do that, we can move to live upgrades, and in, in my opinion, we can move to live upgrades in a much easier path. Uh, it will eventually become a lot easier, and I think it will become routine for people to do upgrades following a certain standard set of guidelines and in a live manner. So this, this is all sort of important things that we have to get around to and OpenStack. Uh, the other reason for me is also we can build a system that does all of this. I, I believe we can. I know it's not, it's not necessarily always easy in open source to get agreement on all these various things, but I think we're sort of at, at a time in OpenStack where we can, the foundation is stable enough and we all sort of understand where it's at that we can start to make these kind of alterations to make the system more reliable. Now that we sort of know that what it means to boot a VM, how to use the cloud in a sort of a dynamic way, we can actually start focusing on what are the problem areas with reliability that we want to address. How do we avoid having corruption of different states that we can't recover from? So at Yahoo, I know at least from our operational standpoint and from just from a developer standpoint, we want to go as many nines as we can. If you ask yourself how many nines does OpenStack have when it can't do like an upgrade, that's, it starts to, the number of nines gets pretty small <laughs> when you have to take it down. And without special strategies to do like different upgrade strategies around a, having new clouds that you bring up and you do migrations over. So there's all these things that we want to try to make it pretty simple and we want to try to increase the reliability of the whole system in general. So it's a win for everybody in, in the end. Uh, so there's this question of how do we get there and, and also what kind, of, uh, what kind of things that can that library bring along if, it, if we actually open those kind of doors. Uh, when you have sort of a thing like Taskful, which I'll get into soon, you can, I think we can enable various things that just haven't been thought about before and sort of bring unique features that, that we can add on to different various OpenStack, OpenStack projects that are sort of being talked about in the design sessions right now. If you were active in yesterday, there was some Nova stuff about tasks. 
Uh, there's how to view this various task state, how to do recovery from those. So there's concepts that are popping up that are, are, are good. And this kind of new doors that we can open for different projects is something that will be pretty powerful, I think, in the next year. And very, very useful for different operational capabilities. So at this point, I guess I'll go into sort of what Taskful is and, and sort of what its goals were for the last five months and how, who's been working on it and where it's actually being used and sort of how it, how it operates. So a little bit about it, uh, we have just recently released a, a PyPy a library version for this. It's uh, been developed by Yahoo, Grid Dynamics, uh, Rackspace, a various few other companies. There's a whole a channel for on IRC that we've been, I started and have been active in. There's a pretty detailed level of documentation uh, that I've been trying to make sure is, it's, it's once people make sure the foundation of this library is very well thought out. So. Uh, yeah, so there's lots of good stuff that I've been trying to follow with respect to practices and, and involvement of the community in general. So there's certain things, though, that it's not, and uh, these are sort of a summary of those, or pieces of those. Uh, currently, it's not trying to be a web, a web service with an API in front of it. There's some sessions, I think, an unconference, perhaps, I'm not exactly 100% sure, but about Mistral, this project that just got announced about uh, two or three weeks ago that's trying to provide sort of a, a more general approach around workflow as a service. So that's, you can, you can there's some sessions on that. Uh, there's also a link that I think off of the main OpenStack page about that. Uh, it's not gonna solve everything. So there's, there's, there's still programmers involved. There still has to be some coding. So you won't get your rainbow pony out of it automatically. Uh, yeah, so you still have to do careful coding, but hopefully it helps in making that carefulness a little bit easier and helps you understand some of the basic principles around re reliability and recoverability. So hopefully this, that's, that's the things that's not, and there's some good stuff that will happen, I think, in he and Mistral and a bunch of other projects around this, these concepts. So I think it's, it's gaining the foundational concepts, which I guess we can talk about now, are sort of, in my opinion, the basic frame of, of task flow. So if you look at most code and it has some kind of structure, right? There's the, the Nova compute booting, has a very structure that sort of spans across three different components. Uh, the API, which does some validation, creates a database record. Uh, you can think of then it goes to the scheduler, the scheduler makes some decision, and then it arrives at the compute node, which actually splits into setting up the, the image, setting up uh, the volume. So it goes through this various structure, if you call that. You can think of that as like your, your house's frame or your application's frame, in a way. Uh, so the thing that this starts to differ in Taskful is that the execution of that workflow or the structure is actually controlled via a concept in Taskful called an engine. So there's this gain, there's, there's, there's this thing you gain when you actually control the execution and that you can actually resume from the execution later, say when you do a, a kill nine of the process that is running that workflow. You can actually pick that back up and then continue working on it. So that eventually gets you to an upgrade strategy that doesn't involve manual labor to figure out what happened and what went wrong. Uh, so there's also this concept of persistence. This is sort of connected into the last area where you need to, to be able to resume something. You need to know, you need to have enough persistence to know where and what was executed so you can actually pick it back up. In certain cases, this you can do this, like if you say, if you have simple persistence layer, you can say persist like a volume ID and you can pick up say, which la what last thing was I doing on that volume ID? Uh, certain things like, if, and if you think of the programming world, you think of like an argument to a function, that's a resource. Those so certain things like that you can't persist, but so we've been working through some sort of best practices that I'll go to later about certain, certain patterns that will, I think will help in Taskful to help you uh, sort of organize the, the code in a way that will work in this manner. So as sort of core to that is this concept of work recovery. So something that's, that's sort of done differently in various open source projects is this concept of how do, I, how do I shut off the process in a way that I can recover from and how do I also handle failures from those different processes. So think about uh, say like a Cinder volume creation. So it goes through a similar steps as, steps as the Nova create or Nova create instance in that it will eventually get down to a stage where it will actually call into the driver man manager and it, will ha it could potentially fail at that stage. So there's this question of what, at, at what, what do you do about the failure case for that scenario? So in Cinder, there's this, they do a similar thing as Nova where they reschedule, but if you, if, you can't actually, if you don't spend a lot of time looking at the code to see that, you won't 
you won't actually sort of understand that that uh, workflow is occurring. So this, the task flow approach to that would be basically uh, you form a bunch of tasks, which I can sort of show in this diagram here. Uh, you form this upper structure here, which is you, I would call the frame of your workflow, and you break it into small little pieces. So you can think of this one as being uh, uh, maybe create your, uh, format your volume, I guess you could call it, and you could call this one to play, maybe place your data on the volume. And then you, you provide various inputs and outputs to sort of do the, con the control execution of this workflow. Uh, this is sort of the uh, top level, high level uh, interface that's, that the task actually provide. There's this code for this actually exists, so this is sort of where that's taken from. Uh, and then you as a library user sort of just construct this thing that will be executed, not as defined up here. It doesn't, it's not actually executed at the point you define it, but it's executed later via this concept down here where you provide this thing called a flow, which is this, is, it was a, there was, there was workflow, uh, we had definition issues in the beginning of task flow where we wanted to make sure that we don't overlap with too many other words that we're all using in various projects, so uh, we decided to go, you can think of a flow as just a bunch of tasks that have some <coughs> connection between them, uh, not you, a workflow if you want to call it that, but don't, you didn't hear that from me. Uh, so yeah, so you provide that kind of information too this concept of an engine. The engine is the controlled execution layer. Uh, it will actually has a compilation mechanism which is pretty basic. It sort of translates, at least in some of these different engine types, it will translate the, this flow here into something simpler, it's, but it's up to the engine to do that. And then it also has this concept of running. So the running is the important one where it actually executes all of these various things that you've set up for it to execute in whatever order that you've defined. Uh, that so then goes down to this stage down here where there's a various set of state transitions that this engine will go through. So you, the, some of them are listed here that are taken out of the source code that uh, there's actually more, but you can see that there's this pending to running, so there's running to success and all those kind of states, so it's failure states. So these things allow you to uh, hook into that mechanism. You can actually watch what's happening to the workflow as it's going on. So that sort of allows pretty detailed level of, oops, level of analysis of what's going on in your workflow. Uh, which is useful for things if in OpenStack in general, like say a Nova Create, you can, they have a, a, a way to actually monitor what's going on in a workflow. So this is where, if you think about the task APIs, if you've been in those sessions for Nova, they want to have a way to actually see what a workflow is doing. So with this kind of state transition notifications, you can actually say write those notifications out to some other database and then you can report that back via an API. So this is sort of the reason why TaskFlow doesn't have an API is that it exposes these underlying capabilities to get that same information. So it also in the back end uh, supports stored the persistence layer which is internal to TaskFlow but is abstracted through an interface so that can be replaced with other implementations. This, this back end that will actually do the persistence of the various transition inputs and outputs and state transitions of the whole workflow, that's useful for when you say this process that's running this uh, dies. So you can basically tell it, I want to resume this engine in this flow, provide it this information from whichever one of these back ends, and then it will restart itself going through the various state transitions to accomplish that. And so that's sort of the, the high level idea of what the whole structure does. So, I guess we can, since I've over, gone over these, we can maybe skip a little bit of this, but. So there's the concept of, in TaskFlow of, of the smallest unit that's possible to actually execute. Uh, you can think of it almost mapping to a function in, program, in, a, in Python, but it's a, this concept of a task object. Uh, it's the smallest thing that will actually do some, some meaningful layer of work. Uh, as you can see here, there's a little bit of different in that, in that it also is expected to revert that same work. So usually, if you, in the, in the function, function oriented world or the object oriented world, you have try accept blocks, right? So this thing, the try block will be the execute part and the, and the exception block will be the reverting block in a, in a way. So that's, that's sort of how it maps to this concept. That the try accept block, of course, you can't actually control the execution of that. So that's, that's one of the issues with that. But uh, it also receives inputs and, and has outputs. So the inputs is so that you can actually take function arguments and you can actually return some useful result that other tasks can depend on existing. So the declares output is sort of an interesting one that for the, the Python people because there's, in most programming languages actually have no way to declare uh, what the outputs of a function are in, in, a, in a meaningful way. So especially Python where you sort of, it can be anything in a, in a way. So the sort of the flow composition here 
actually organizes all these different tasks into, into some kind of structure that will use these inputs and outputs to do some meaningful work. So say um, you do a volume creation, you want to have a, a, a task that actually outputs maybe the, the database record result of that creation in a, in a database. And then you can have some further result after that actually go and process the, uh, the volume and actually make, make maybe a, a, a device for that. So you can organize your workflow in a way that's similar to how you'd organize it in, in a functional manner, but you can also do various different things like dependency order, which is something that's a little bit different in, in, in that you don't see that in functional oriented programming too much, where you can do topological ordering of your tasks. So say if you have dependencies of your tasks, uh, maybe A would depend on B and B would depend on C, you can order these in a way that the engine using this workflow, at, I mean, sorry, the workflow that's doing it in topological ordering can actually automatically <coughs> infer how to run your workflow in a way that satisfies all the tasks, inputs, and outputs. So that's, that's still, it's, it's we're, I'm trying to see certainly uh, if where that's useful in OpenStack at the moment. Most of the stuff in OpenStack is sort of a linear kind of pattern where you have, say, Cinder doing these certain set of steps. Uh, so that one, we're still working on if to how, where, where that can be useful. I think it's useful in, if you look at how Heat does their stuff, they, they do more advanced topological ordering than most projects in OpenStack currently do. So we're try trying to create as many, a, a small set of ways that will be useful for different projects, but, so that's one of them. And probably more useful for Heat than others if they wanted to use that. So, Josh? so sort of uh, the engine use case, uh, here, what engines do, of course, as I described a little bit before, is they go through these different state transitions uh, which we've, you, you, there's a link on that, we can, like, once I share these later, uh, that, that sort of describes exactly what the state transitions are. So they're pretty well defined. I mean, this is one of the things I want to make sure that happened in Tassel is that instead of having to go to the code to figure out what is going on, uh, there's pretty good documentation on what, is, what the state transitions are. They're pr up to date. So uh, there's a pretty well defined set of state transitions. So I think some of the basics you saw before were pending to running, uh, running to resuming, so there's those kind of state transitions. Once you define those and you have this kind of engine layer that actually knows how to use those, you can sort of bring along these re resumable behaviors uh, that are pretty useful for various projects to actually recover from upgrades and to recover from various failures that you still would have to do manually before. Uh, yeah, sure, go, good, thank you. Um, one of the tasks you mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, it will revert, yeah. It will revert, yes. It handles, it does that automatically. We're working on some stuff around having that be sort of a strategy defined. So sometimes you don't want to go through all of them before. You want to go up to a certain point through what we call, what we've been calling it a checkpoint. You want to go back to the last checkpoint and maybe you can collapse all the different tasks into one, uh, one, re run, one reversion task instead of having many. So yeah, so we right now we've focused on sort of the, just the simplest one, which is just go backwards through all of them. And yeah, so that's, that's yeah, sure, go ahead. That raises the question, what about re retrieval? Uh-huh, so that's also, we've been thinking about that, and that's in the same kind of strategy area that we're working on. So yes, it will, we, yeah, we've been working on that a little bit. Sure. There's no, there's no such item. Uh, so I, I don't, I think it's, it can be, but there doesn't have to be. I don't think we're forcing it because I don't think you can force it. In, in, a, pro, in a project like OpenStack, it's hard to pull off item potency in, in a pure manner. At, at this stage, I think if, we, if it was forced from like stage zero, maybe we'd have better chances, but then you might have, already, I don't, I probably wouldn't have to develop this library if it, that happened. <laughs> yeah, so and there's no force. I don't think it's, it's hard to force it when, when there's so many diverse workflows that are already in place, in, in my opinion, yeah. Sure. Question back there. So yeah, so I got the, so let me repeat the question. Can you please so, repeat the question? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. So the question was, uh, Mistral will be built around this. Well, it will provide that REST API and how much of it exists, sort of, right? That's sort of the general gist. Uh, so Mistral is still in the designing phase, so it doesn't actually exist yet. I think it was more, they're, they're trying to make sure that, that the use cases for it are really well understood and pretty and really well documented, but we've been, I've been interacting with them around using Pascal as the underlying layer, and we're going to see how that's going to go, and I think it, to me it's more important that, that they define 
the limited set of what they want to accomplish because you can, you can sort of think of, if this is just a general programming paradigm, you can say, uh, we're just going to do anything with it. So to me, it's, more, it's really important that they, ha they have been and are working on making sure that they have a very well-defined set of use cases and, and try not to overlap with two different many projects. So yeah, so eventually, I think they will provide that API around workflows. What it will be, I think it's still to be decided, so yeah. Yeah, yeah. So let me see if I understand that. So uh, is, it, is it targeted for any use case or, or a limited set, yeah? So I've been, uh, as, a, as an OpenStack project, it's more targeted toward the use cases that are in the various OpenStack projects just because that's where I'm trying to aim first and, and foremost. It's in general though, I've tried to keep it disconnected in a way that you can actually use it outside of OpenStack. So I, I think it, it's applicable to both areas. I know that there are certain companies like that are using it not for, for internal kind of projects. Uh, I think at and I've talked on so with some folks from there, and they're using it for something internal. I don't exactly know what. So it's not strongly connected to like, it doesn't require that Nova be there. It's, it's a library that sort of, uh, it's a paradigm in a way, so it doesn't force it. Yeah. So, sure. Question, yeah. So, that, yeah, so, oh, sorry, let me just that. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, so the question was, is Taskflow similar to Amazon Simple Workflow Service? I would say no. It, Mistral, maybe. I don't know, but that one's TBD. So Mistral, if you, it, the work, Amazon Workflow Service is basically like a REST API that you provide a workflow definition to, and you provide it, it, it sort of activates that for you, right? So Taskflow isn't designed to be that, at that level. It could be something that is used by Mistral or something else to actually accomplish that. But yeah, it's not targeted to be that. At that, I mean, if people use it for that, then sure. But sure. Oh, Mike. Yeah, sure. Wow. Yeah, I see that you're providing uh, for parallelism here, which is a really good thing for scale. But I'm wondering if you include things such as exclusion or synchronization, which becomes essential when you're when you're doing distributed mm -hmm. uh, tasks. Yep, yeah, yeah. So there's there's plan to have have some kind of synchronization mechanisms, although it's a heated debate around that area in OpenStack. Uh, uh, I'm letting it settle down a little bit in various other places first. Yeah, why are you looking over here? <laughs> and we'll see how that goes. And and then I'm gonna just gonna if they, once they work it out a little bit, then we'll I'll just piggyback on their stuff and. And then uh, we'll see how that goes. Yeah, no, there well, will I'd, be. I think it'd be more useful for you to be a little more aggressive in informing them that. Uh, that oh, they're. I, I'm pretty sure they're well informed. <laughs> <laughs> they're right here. Right. Okay. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. It's. A, I think it's a known problem. You know, it's a known known thing that's being worked on in OpenStack. That kind of distributed system and how to do the synchronization around it. It's not just open. It's not just heat. That it's not no, no aiming at heat or anything. They're just the first ones to try to figure out how do we. How do we sort of fix this in, in yeah, a way that works? Sitting yeah. in, the, in the neutron sessions, they keep mentioning their races and for this or that. And it's yes, like, yeah, I, I don't. I think yeah, it's not just neutron. I think it, it's a lot of places that are they're starting to realize like the issue a little bit, and, and heat is the first one, in my opinion, to actually start attacking it a little bit. So good work, heat people, open the front. Question? <laughs> sure. Any more questions? Where I can move back on here? a little bit? Shoot. Oh, way back here. Uh oh, that um, one might be hard to hear. At what points do you write to the database for persistence? Sure. So at, at currently at every state transition. So that means when the function, uh, there, so there's various, actually there's a various schema. There's the, the tasks that are actually backed by the database. They have a state that's associated. So at every state transition of a task that the engine moves through, it will write to the database. So yeah, it's so going to be a little database heavy there. But as, say, a task returns some information, it's going to also write it there too. So when it returns, say, uh, I don't know, a, a string or something, it's going to write back to the database so that that can be used later. This was also, just keep in mind that this is not probably the most best way, and I think that's why we want to bring in this concept of checkpointing where we can sort of collapse some of these, this information that's being stored into something smaller. So, so does each task have to be item potent? Because you'll restart that task later, right? Uh, yeah, but it's not going to, it's going to skip over a task that's already ran. So it but if you run half of the task and it left behind some state 
and then you rerun it, then it'll have to know that it could possibly have so it's, run. It's not, so yeah, so a task that, yeah, so if, if, if the task halfway through fails, then your question is how it's going to restart that one? Yeah? Yeah, so well. So, so the tasks have to be item prone, but the whole flow The whole workflow doesn't, doesn't yes. Yeah. So that's, right. that's, that's a good characterization, yeah. Okay. So in general, I think they sort of expect that in code. How do you, I think you have, you have to prepare for that one no matter what, right? So, but yes. Well, in your volume example, I called the driver, and then it failed, and the driver might, the storage might have made the volume, it might not have. Mm -hmm. So the drivers now have to know that the driver might already exist and that it's not necessarily an error. Sure, 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 sure. Okay. So I think, yeah, so it's, it's not, it's, if a task is idempotent, then that definitely helps in resuming. But if, if the whole structure isn't idempotent, which I think it isn't necessarily an open stack, fun. then right. it will help out in that area. Yeah. So yeah, the question is, does rollback sort of save you there? Uh, yeah, I think it does. I mean, it, it, it does save you. It, it just like, it, if, if you have, if the simple rollback strategy may not be suitable for everyone, so yeah. But there's this question around, the, the driver question is a good one, and it's a good question that sort of we, we're ongoing in Cinder is like the driver layer, especially when things go into the driver layer, they're almost like a black box. So it's hard to actually pull off almost any kind of recovery at the driver layer without having a pretty well-defined state machine what that's supposed to be the driver or what, what is supposed to go on inside the driver. So I think there's, there's ongoing work, at least in Cinder, from what I've been talking with sort of, uh, what is here, Duncan and various other people in the Cinder team about how to sort of formalize that, that state machine. So you can actually do that kind of recovery. So uh, there's certain work in Taskflow that we're working on for, for Ice House to make that happen. So the driver layer is an interesting one that's sort of a, it's a problematic case in, in I think a lot of projects that you, you sort of don't know what happens after you make the function call, it sort of just happens. And then you hope that whatever is item pulling at that stage. Sure. I was just gonna say in that particular respect, has there been any talk about having the driver uh, simply contribute subsections of the workflow? And then have the actual execution yeah, be wholly con mm -hmm. contained inside one. So there has, but it's 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 resistance in that it changes a lot of the driver. <laughs> yep. Yeah, it changes sort of, it, it sort of flips it on its head. So that's sort of, it, I think there's there's potential there maybe in the future, but it changes so much of the current code. To that, Certainly disrupts. So that yeah, that's Absolutely. that's the harder part. And then I think I think yeah, people I've people I've talked to that's like yeah, that we should we could if we put it if you just have it return what it's going to do, then you can sort of just control that right. Right. But it, the way the current drivers work, they're more of a black box. So it yeah. sort of it completely changes. But I think in the end, I think probably it will maybe end up like that. But okay. time will tell. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. So as we were sort of talking right now about. The engine that actually runs these things. Uh, let's see where did I leave off. Uh, there's a current. There's currently a couple of limitations of these engines. So if you think of the concept that is the controlled execution, you can once you control the execution, you can actually run that 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 workflow in various. Man oh, 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 wait one second. Uh, I, I have a, I have a question. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. You mentioned the up, upgrades as an important use case here. So yeah. Can, how do you if, if you are using Taskflow and uh -huh. you want to in your version 2.0, change the workflow. Mm -hmm. What happens during an upgrade? So, so we've yeah. So it's a good question. So we're we're putting in some hook endpoints that you can actually do. It it sort of begins in, almost into the same area as migrations for a database, and not 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 the full set of it, but a smaller set. In that you, if you want to change, you want to do an upgrade of a version of a workflow, you can actually hook into Taskflow to analyze what was executed, and you can actually t interrogate it and say, I don't want to execute that same thing again, or I want to add on new tasks to that workflow. Yeah, so it's, a, it's an area that I've written up. We, there's some documentation I can point out to you at the end about it, if you want, about some of our current thinking about how to do that, how to add, how to change a workflow if it's being upgraded or it's being modified during the software upgrade that, that's, that's after you've done the software upgrade, right? So there, yeah, there's been certain current thinking about how to do it and how to do it in a way that doesn't like actually fail. So yeah, there has been some thinking about it. It's not, it's not simple stuff but there has been some thought about it, at least. It requires, it, it's almost similar to the database migrations in a, in, a, in, a, in a certain way, but yeah, it's more complicated than that, but that's the gist of it. But there's been some thinking. We can maybe talk after about it if you want. Sure. Cool. So back to the concept of this execution layer. So when you can sort of define your workflow 
and that's separate from how you're executing the workflow. One of the things that uh, we were working on in the Havana release was sort of these basic ways of executing things that, that matched uh, how they can be used in various OpenStack projects. Uh, to start off, you may not want a complicated way of executing things, but so you may want to use these first two listed types here. But at a more complicated and more uh, complex level is you want a way to actually distribute that workflow across various machines. So there was some work done by some uh, Rackspace folks and others as well as me to start working on that and continue evolving that. This is, it's, a way, it's a very more complicated piece because you have to worry about RPC timeouts, uh, how, does, how does the code of the, the coordination between all these different work, the tasks that are running, how does that work? And so that's a work in progress, but I think that's the most powerful one that will help a lot of the different OpenStack projects sort of distribute their work in a way that they don't have to repeat doing that in every single project. Like Glance has this Glance work concept that they want, but uh, also I think Heat has a heat, work, a heat engine concept that they want to distribute work as well. So there's this re repetition of work that I think if, if it's not repeated and if there's sort of an organization around it, you can actually use a standard set and not have to worry about that. So I mean, I doubt that Glance really wants to maintain a worker concept and have to have a deployment strategy that accommodates this. So having that as a central library that can sort of try to provide a decent enough for everybody mechanism, if, if it's possible, via this distributed engine, uh, I think will be pretty useful for the various projects. So that one's, of course, is still work in progress, but we're hoping to work on something that will work for some basic scenarios in Ice House and get some more feedback there and see how that goes. But the first two ones actually exist right now. Uh, and we're working on improving them and making, making various projects use them or getting them integrated into various projects and making them. Uh, so back to the little bit of the persistence layer, this is sort of an interesting one. This is sort of describes a little bit what, what we're persisting and how it's sort of useful in general. Uh, as described here, it sort of just saves the task state, the progress, or the results of the tasks to some persistence layer. It doesn't have to be a database, but the ones that we implemented for Icehouse, I mean Havana, or sort of a database and a file system and just a local in memory for testing those kind of use cases. Uh, once you sort of have that persistence layer, you can actually reconstruct it and you can actually start resuming. And of course, it brings into this question of how do you upgrade a workflow now? Now that you've paused it and you maybe shut off the software, what do you do when it starts back up? So those, all those kind of questions come into play once you have that capability. So I think it's good to have those kind of questions in general because otherwise, yeah, it hasn't really worked out. But uh, so another son of the, the interesting part that sort of is being asked about a lot in the various projects, even in this design summit, is I want to see the task API, right? I want to see what the history of what was running and what happened, and I want to sort of a play-by-play -play action of what's going on. If you, if you try a Nova boot right now, you'll, you'll see that it goes through a limited set of states, and they're not easy to sort of figure out what's going to happen or what may happen and what was the failure mode. So when you have this kind of persistence layer, you can expose that via an API to say what were my tasks doing or uh, what, what, what failed and what was the failure. So that's also useful for internal usage in that we can undo those, the, that various chain of actions that occurred. But it's also used for just for users to see what happened and the progress that happened and the whole workflow cycle. So those kind of things are, are very useful in my opinion for internal and external usage by the various users of Taskflow. So another concept that uh, is sort of unique that I developed, all, all, I guess, in the early phases, but it's not, not all there in the, the current release, is this concept of a, a higher level job that gets executed. So if you, if you think of a, a Nova Compute uh, run instance call as being a high level, a top level entity, say, you basically want to create a, a VM. So that itself is composed of a bunch of derivative set of tasks or workflows uh, that actually accomplish that goal. So, Right now in the projects, you look at the different mechanisms that that's being executed, you'll see that it spans about three different components. It's, uh, it's, a, it's sort of hard to follow, but that's, that's all things that this is gonna help with. But in an ideal world, if you know that set of workflows and the tasks, and you have that top level connector, you can actually transfer that top level connector, uh, the run instance request, immediately if it fails. So this is where an interesting concept comes in, say, uh, the Nova computer or, or something that's relatively easy to do, we'll start off with that, is uh, if it fails uh, on a worker, do say the worker being disconnected from the network or the, the power cycles. Uh, that kind of connection to this thing, mechanism called a job board, you can actually, a job board here, which is sort of similar to the little picture down here, uh, you can actually reconnect 
that uh, repost that kind of job back to the job board, or you can think of it as a, as a queue in a way, and you can actually allow another entity to start resuming that, that workflow. So when you have the workflow like concept, you can actually just restart it and hope that it works on the next worker, or you can undo it on another worker. So it sort of helps in the scenario where uh, a Nova Compute or some other uh, entity will actually fail, and then you want to continue working on, say, some various job in, in a way that's highly available. So this, it's, it's still being worked out, the whole details around this, I'm still prototyping it a little bit, but the, the concept I, th I think is pretty useful in, in a way that lets you perform tasks that may, that may be item potent or may not be in a way that you can sort of continue working on them if they uh, fail on one worker or fail on another worker, you can actually just continue working on them or undo as, as whatever is appropriate. So this is sort of where I'm, I'm a little bit weird, but the, there's going there may there's a zookeeper kind of way to do this. There's a various other backing implications. So uh, if you look at the mailing list recently, there's some zookeeper stuff. So I'm I'm letting that filter out a little bit before uh, uh, yeah that code goes in task flow. So that's another one I'm thankful for these guys up in the front pushing the boundaries a little bit. So yeah. So it, but we'll see how that works out and which backing implementation it finally becomes. But the concept still I think is useful. So, so what exists is another question. So, since it's the whole this whole task flow library started about, uh, I guess five months ago or around then, uh, what we got in so far at this release, what I call the zero one release, which was I guess about a week and a half ago, uh, it sort of contains the whole the, the abstraction around the tasks, the workflows, uh, the, the way to connect those together, uh, the way to resume them, the basic persistence layer, and, and the, what I call the local engines, which is the non-distributed ones that were listed on that table. Uh, I've been pretty proud that we've tried to make it really well documented of what all the, like the, how to use it, some examples, the state transitions, so because these are all pretty basic concepts that if they're not well understood, they're gonna be, it just makes it really hard to use. So I tried to make sure that these are all in the wiki, I think wiki.openstack.org. Uh, test last task flow is, is one way to get there. But I guess once we release these slides, you can all click on those links too. Uh, so what's missing? Some of the stuff that's being worked on or under construction. As was mentioned, the distributed engine, we want to get something going there that will satisfy a basic set of needs. Uh, something simple, I hope, to start or continue on the work that was done by others to work on that. Uh, so various projects can use it. So they don't have to rebuild the same mechanism. Or oh, needlessly, unneedlessly, sorry. So that will help out with the glance, so I think once that, uh, we'll see who else needs it or desires it. I think various projects want it. We'll just, it's gonna be an interesting one to work on to see how we can make that possible. Uh, there's this locking service, which I'm still unsure if it's needed or not, but I think at, at the lowest level of task flow, it may be needed when, but we'll see. That one's a work in progress as well. I'm letting the heat thing filter out a little bit before I more on that. Uh, the Zookeeper storage layer is if, uh, as a backend to the persistence layer, so we have pluggable backends to where this data is persisted. Uh, there's going to be a little bit of work, I think, on having a Zookeeper backend to that as well. Uh, this job and job board concept, I've been working on a little bit uh, to this week and last week on that. So working through that and seeing how that's going to work out. So those, those to me are not like key primary things that were needed in Havana or even Ice House. Uh, so. These are more of additional things that I'm hoping that will happen for the next release. Uh, 0.2, or we haven't officially named the version or which one we're going to do, but uh, sort of, yeah. Maybe I can click on some of these. Let's see if this will work. I can show you some little examples. Maybe not. Let's find out here. There's a bunch of examples there yeah, that I put up. At, Time? Okay. Time, time? Yeah. Oh, well, that was fun. Good work, guys. <laughs> okay. Time's up. Yep. Okay. Let me just, let me just say last thing. Yep. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Here's just, yeah, chat with me afterwards.